All right. Hi, everybody. And good afternoon. <laughs> so excited to see you all here. I see we already have about 30 folks joining us. Um, we're so excited to have you here for exploring the Subaru and Dallas, the virtual workshop. And I couldn't be more thrilled to have awesome partners here with me today. Um, our workshop is starting right at 12, and we plan to finish at one, if not a little bit before. I'd love to start by um, introducing my wonderful colleagues. First, I have Fran Boss, who is the Objects Conservator and Interim Chief Conservator at the Dallas Museum of Art. Fran, if you want to wave. <laughs> then we have Hilary Bober, the Archivist at the Dallas Museum of Art. And Catherine Broadbreck, the Hoffman Family Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the Dallas Museum of Art. From now on, I'm just going to say DMA, and I'll assume that everybody knows what I mean, because Dallas Museum of Art is a handful, or mouthful, I should say. I also have Anna Kern, who's the Manager of Arts at North Park Center. And I'm Melissa Gonzalez. I'm a gallery educator at the Nasher Sculpture Center. And it's just a great opportunity to explore some wonderful sculptures that we have throughout Dallas by the artist Mark DeSubro. Just to give you a sense of how today will work, I'll start with a little bit of background information about the artist, and then we'll go in order by museum, uh, starting in chronological order. So the DMA will go first, and then Nasher, and then North Park. We will leave a little bit of time at the end of each section for questions. If you look at your menu, probably on the bottom of your screen, I know it's different for every kind of device, but you'll see the Q&A and you can click there if you have any questions. If you have comments, just so it's easy for us to see the questions all together, comments can go in the chat bar. Um, for instance, I would love to see where everybody is watching from. Is everyone from Dallas? Are people from Plano or Fort Worth or farther? If you wanna put in the chat where you're from, we would love to see that. Um, our shared section, We'll go for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll do an optional art activity at the end. So it's your choice whether or not you wanna stay for the activity. The five of us will probably chat a little bit too, so you can maybe hear, I don't know, how goofy we are at the end of a webinar. And then our plan is to sign off at one o'clock. I would love to start though, and get a sense of which sculptures you all have seen in person. So you should see a poll now, and you can click on multiple sculptures. Which ones have you seen in person? And I'll give you about another 15 seconds to answer. I know not all of you maybe were prepared to have to touch your laptop or iPad or phone or whatever it is you're looking at. So which ones of these have you seen? We'll say five more seconds. And I'm gonna end the poll now. And we can see, wow. So everyone has seen the DMA sculpture and everyone has seen the Nasher sculpture. That makes great sense because we're just across the street from each other and just about everybody has seen the North Park sculpture. So that's so cool. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and start with my section. Like I said, if you ever have a question, just uh, put it in the question and answer. And uh, let's get started. I'm super excited to have you all here. All right. Oh, I guess I could have had that up here earlier, but oh well. <laughs> So starting with Mark DeSuvero. Doesn't look like my slides want to advance. Does anyone see the next slide or does it look like a big white screen? Great. All right, let me get out of here for a moment. You know, it wouldn't be a Zoom webinar if there wasn't some kind of, hmm, what's going on here? How do we look now? See a picture? Yes? Awesome. Okay. 
Mark DeSubro was born in September of 1933 in Shanghai, China. He was born to Italian parents. And this is a picture of him at four years old in China. His father was formerly an Italian naval officer and he was working in China as an Italian consulate. His family was Jewish and they were vocally anti-fascist. So in 1941, under the threat of deportation to a concentration camp with the rise of World War II and the Japanese invasion and occupation of China, the Suber and his family immigrated to the United States. They landed and settled in San Francisco. The Subaru studied sculpture and philosophy, and he earned a philosophy degree at the University of California at Berkeley. And just after graduating, he attended an abstract expressionist exhibition. And at that moment, or soon thereafter, he decided to pursue a career in art. And his early works were sculptures made of plaster and abstract expressionist style paintings. He moved to New York City, as many young artists do, to pursue that career and um, started making sculptures out of materials that were readily available and inexpensive. So largely reclaimed found materials like wood timbers, barrels, chains, rope, anything he could get his hands on that he didn't have to pay a lot of money for. And he was preparing for his first exhibition at Robert Bellamy's Green Gallery in the fall of 1960. Earlier that year, he was working an odd job getting paid $2 an hour as a cabinet maker's assistant and was riding on top of an elevator with a load of lumber when the elevator didn't stop. And he was pinned at the top of the building for close to an hour with a ton of pressure across his back. Um, it ended up breaking his back and his two legs were paralyzed and his doctors told him that he would never walk again. At the time, he wanted to continue with making art and um, wasn't sure about whether he would be able to participate in the gallery, but he luckily had assistance from his brother and his friends. And so he debuted three of his sculptural works at the Bellamy Gallery um, later on that fall. And here we have one of those works. This is titled K. Faro Senza Yuridice. Pretty sure, testing my Italian accent there. This is from 1959. So De Subaru was at a turning point here. He realized that if he wanted to continue making these big sculptures out of heavy materials, he would also have to accept the help from others to construct them because he just didn't have at the time the physical strength required. And he decided this instead to change his focus to steel. And so while he was sitting in a wheelchair recovering, he put an asbestos apron on his lap and honed his welding skills, welding skills and started making sculptures of steel and wood. And by the 1960s, mid 1960s, so that's within about four years, he was able to walk again, a time with the help of uh, crutches and wheelchair. And he started making large scale steel sculptures and was the first American to do so, and is considered a pioneer in this scale and medium. So having a serious accident like that didn't stopped the super from being incredibly active in the making of his sculpture. He knows how to operate all of the equipment needed, including cranes and cherry pickers, um, forklifts. And as you can see, he's super active when it comes to his sculptures. That first one was from 1967, and this photo is from 1981. Um, the crane he considers a major artist tool for himself and has said, the crane is my paintbrush. Here he is in 1998. So me being afraid of heights, I get nervous just looking at that. Um, Super continues to be an active artist. He's 86 years old now, 87 years old in September. He actually burned himself on his leg in the last year and had to amputate part of his leg below the knee, but that doesn't stop him. Here he is still in a crane working on the construction of his sculpture. So whether it was right after his accident um, 40 years ago or just last year, it doesn't matter. He can use these, these tools to help him make his art. All right, so that's my quick uh, background on the Subaru. I also want to ask our second question, which is, 
which sculptures did DeSubro personally help to install? And you can again select all that apply. Did he help with the DMA? Did he help with the Nasher? Did he help with North Park? One or two or three of all of them? I have a feeling this is a guess, so don't feel bad if later on you find out that you're not right, because actually I don't know the correct answer either. I can't wait to hear. And I'll give you about another 15 seconds again. All right, here's the end of our poll and our results. We have a feeling that we're pretty sure he helped to install the Nasher, and also I would say pretty sure the DMA in North Park. So hang in there, and uh, I think you'll probably find out over the course of our presentation. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Catherine to start with the Dallas Museum of Art. Thanks so much, Melissa, and thank you so much for organizing this. I'm super excited to be here. I'm going to attempt to share my screen, see if I have some better luck. You... Can you guys see my screen? Okay, great. So um, our presentation from the DMA is from Paris to Dallas to the world, which is a bit of a pun on a Dior exhibition that we had. But um, as Hillary's going to discuss with us, this uh, very large sculpture has had quite a journey. And so I think it's a very um, physically impressive one. I just wanted to um, give a few words about Mark as an artist. He did such a lovely job um, introducing his practice, Melissa, and it's been a great pleasure for me to dig a little more um, into him. Um, as you said, he was really a great practitioner of the abstract expressionist style. Um, and you can tell that by the real dynamic um, use of kind of line geometry and color in his works. And I tried my hardest to match um, the art today by wearing my kind of reddish orange dress. And I'm sure Fran will talk a little bit too about color matching, which is a really um, interesting part of his practice as well. And as Hillary will talk about in her talk, um, again, this work has traveled. So we have it here in two of the DMA's locations. But I just wanted to bring one fun kind of art historical fact about de Ciro, um, that I really enjoyed reading about. I knew that he had taken um, part in the Peace Tower installation in LA, which we see here on the left from 1966. So as Melissa said in his background, you know, he grew up um, in a very politically active family that was very anti-fascist. And this really took um, part in his more mature of as his um, protest against the Vietnam War, which was a hot button topic for a lot of artists. So he was part of the artist protest committee and spearheaded um, the design of this protest monument that was made with a lot of collaborators. And it was really a great collaborative um, project. So many artists were involved in constructing it and then also hanging their art on it. And there was some really great examples of um, Los Angeles artists who participated directly with DeSubro in this work that you might not associate their work um, with his, but they were really close collaborators. So I'm bringing two examples of very important African-American artists that are recent um, additions to the DMA's collection. So Melvin Edwards and Charles White were both intimately involved um, in the protest and installation of this work. Betty Saar, Judy Chicago, a lot of um, feminist and African-American activists who are also artists. So I think his um, political engagement has been very long-standing. He did a similar um, work actually in response to the Iraq War with the Whitney Museum in 2006. Um, and also something that's really fun, if you were here before we started talking, you saw that one of the Nasher sculptures is actually um, kinetic, it moves. And as Hillary, I'm sure, will show us, you're not supposed to climb on the DMA sculpture. In no way would I advocate for that. Uh, but DeSubro really believed that art has a close uh, interaction with the environment and with the spectator. So he made works that were particularly participatory and had different engagements um, with the spectator. So I think that that was part of his practice or is part of his practice as well. And he's really been a great advocate for both emerging artists and for public art. So he's really one of the first, I think public art now feels very ubiquitous to us. Um, but in the 60s, it was a very radical gesture to think so explicitly about um, showing things outdoor for the public. Um, so I think that that's a really great kind of opportunity to connect with that history. So I'm going to pass it over to Hillary and I will be the slide, um, slide lady. 
And also, if you want to directly ask your questions during our um, talk, I'll also moderate a discussion. If there's any questions that you guys have after this presentation, I'll read them after. But I'll mute myself now. Hillary, take it away. All right. So the DMA is to Subaru sculpture Ave, which um, one article I read translated as bird, um, was created in 1973 along with four other works. Um, while DeSuvro had a residency of sorts in a small industrial town um, called Ch chalon sur um, in eastern France, and I will pre apologize for my French pronunciations for the next few slides. Um, so he was given the use of a factory space for two years, and in return that one of the works, um, which would be chosen by popular vote, would be gifted and installed in the town's public square. Uh, next slide, please. So all five works were exhibited in the Tuileries Gardens in Paris in 1975. Um, and this exhibition was the first show by a living artist and the first time American avant-garde sculpture was on view with the classical sculptures that graced the Tuileries. The DMA purchased Ave before it was shown actually at the Tuileries through the Irvin L. and Barrow P. Levy Endowment Fund. Um, and so it would take a little bit of time for it to finally make it to Dallas. Uh, next slide. So after the Tuileries show, four of the five Chanel works traveled to New York and were included in the Whitney Museum of American Arts exhibition, Mark de Subro, which was on view November 13th, 1975 through February 8th, 1976. Now, in addition to works in the galleries, the show also featured 14 de Subro sculptures installed in public parks and outdoor spaces in all five boroughs of New York. Um, Ave was installed in Flushing Meadow Park near the location of the New York State Pavilion for the 1964 World's Fair. And you can see that globe sculpture that was so emblematic of that World's Fair um, behind Ave in this picture. Um, next. At the close of the Whitney show, Ave made its final journey to Dallas. When the Dallas Morning News reported on the acquisition um, in August of 1975, then director Harry S. Parker III said, quote, this is a daring monumental piece of sculpture, which I suspect will set a high standard for public art in Dallas. Next. So Mark DeSuvro came to Dallas in February of 1976 to oversee the installation of Ave on the Lagoon Side Entrance Plaza of the museum in Fair Park. So whoever guessed that he came uh, to uh, help install the DMA sculpture, that one is one of them. Um, and it was initially installed on a sort of a concrete pad. Next. Um, but since DeSuvro's attempt, as Catherine mentioned, was for people to climb on the sculpture, um, a sand base was uh, shortly or soon thereafter added for safety. And you can see both the sand base and some climbers um, in this promotional photo for ArtFest 76. Um, next. When the museum moved from Fair Park to downtown, Ave was deinstalled, transported, and reinstalled in its current home on Ross Plaza in September 1983, which was just in time for the grand opening of the sculpture garden that October. There is a story that when Ave was being moved that a construction worker at a site uh, across from the museum thought that the um, Ave's I-beams were actually construction materials and not part of a work of art. Um, though I can't actually confirm the validity of this story and it's possibly quite an apocryphal tale. Next. So as DeSuvro intended, again, children greatly enjoyed playing on the piece, um, such as here on the DMA's opening day on January 29th, 1984. And just in case any of this has given you any ideas, you are no longer allowed to climb on the Ave. And I'm going to turn it over to Fran now. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Fran Boss and uh, one of three conservators at the DMA, and I'm an objects conservator. I'm going to show you a few images from the recent conservation treatment of our DeSuvro and explain some of the challenges that we faced. I was part of a team of five, three conservators and two preparators, who treated the sculpture last October. In this image here, 
It's our before image and notice the paint fading, especially on the beam that is facing towards us. This sculpture, as it has been mentioned, is made of steel eye beams painted in intense red. To lay a foundation for the conservation of outdoor sculpture, outdoor painted surfaces require more frequent conservation treatments than say a sculpture housed inside a museum because they are faced with harsh environments. They are exposed to intense light, UV fading, our harsh Texas weather, thunderstorms, hail, birds, ground keepings, and other accidental damage. As such, conservation treatments on outdoor painted sculpture often involve the full repainting of a sculpture. And this is the case for our sculpture, which has undergone many repaints since its creation in 1973. This is taken seriously and there must be a dialogue between curatorial, conservation, the paint industry, and the artist studio. The decisions are not one that we take lightly and full documentation of all of our decisions made is necessary to meet our conservation ethical guidelines. Next slide. These three images show some of the issues that we faced from left to right, paint flaking, fading, scuffs and scratches. Treatments on large works are often complex and expensive undertakings. Since it had been over 10 years since the last repainting, it was starting to show signs of aging. But as I mentioned, it is a large, expensive and logistical procedure. What we did was a modified yet thorough treatment. We weighed the ethical and practical choices and balanced the durability and respect for the original artist's intent. Next slide. In discussions with the artist studio, Space Time in Long Island, New York, and with Tanemic Paint Company, we developed a method to use a new formulation of paint. Paint formulations change over time, and this paint was found to have excellent aging properties. The color swatch, or, or often called a drawdown, was confirmed by all properties as the important target color and sheen for our sculpture. DeSouvero developed his signature red color over many years, and ours is an early red. It is a bit more orange than others. Next slide. And indeed, it is the right color. We compared it to the samples of the previous paint swatches we had, just to ease my mind. I went outside and compared it to the sculpture. Notice where the paint color matches in the area where it's protected from the sun damage. This rectangular swatch we received will be kept in the dark for future matching, and the studio also has a copy. Next slide. First up, we proceeded with a thorough and powerful deep clean, knocking off any loose previous paint coatings, dirt, debris, and in our case, lots of spider eggs. Those are the black specks that you see on the underside. Next slide. The next few images show the extreme heights that we had to deal with. We're all certified to run boom lifts. Though the DMA has a boom lift, we needed two during this treatment. Notice we had to put down plywood so we wouldn't sink into the grass. Cords are everywhere and another logistic that we had to constantly monitor. Next slide. Let's pause and enjoy this view. Also to note, Texas weather is very unpredictable and trying to gauge and schedule around rain, heat, crazy and harsh storms was a feat in itself, waiting for the right weather. We also had to schedule around events, exhibitions and a very busy work schedule. Next slide. Next up, the layers of paint. We went down to a secure base layer and used a, spe a special patch paint for areas of exposed metal especially at the tips where the steel occasionally comes in contact with water. This will help the, prevent corrosion. Then we spray applied the fluoropolymer paint layers, which is a two-part durable paint meant to be used on steel. Each side of the eye beam needed to be repeatedly coated evenly, and that is key. There's a lot of square footage, a lot of paint, a lot of mixing, and a lot of time. We had to wear protective gear, or PPE, as the paint, as we shall say, is quite industrial. The work is physically demanding, especially in PPE, including a respirator. In the sun, holding a spray can, a spray unit, for long periods of time at awkward angles. Next slide. 
Though it took months in planning and was an intense eight days outside, we are very pleased with the outcome and it is good to reconnect with the studios, the artist studio and the paint company. Next slide. We are proud to have our signature piece looking good again. Next slide. And for fun, this, this video can be found on YouTube if um, it's a one minute summation of what I just said, but, but it's fun. So if you want to see if it works, if we have time. Doesn't seem to have audio. Hmm. Maybe if I unmute myself, does this work? We acquired it in 1976. It was originally placed at the Fair Park location of the museum. We put it here on Ross Plaza in 1989. Working on outdoor sculptures can be difficult for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, the, the object can be met with all sorts of harsh environments. But you also have a scale to deal with. This is not a small work of art that you have to work on. It's a 45 foot high I-beam construction piece. I do hope you come see us on Ross Plaza. Come see our newly refreshed, newly treated Ave by Marcus Subro. That's it for, for us. Um, please come visit us. Thank you, Fran. I love seeing that video and I love all those technical details of the cleaning of that sculpture too. And it looks gorgeous now. All right, we have another poll and our next poll is what? It's not what I don't want to do that. Our next poll is now. Do you all have any idea what serves as great inspiration for Mark DeSuvro? You can select all that apply. And we'll take 10 more seconds. All right, I think getting close to all votes being in. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now and share the results. Looks like most of us think music, probably most of us think poetry, pretty close literature, theater. I think these are all great guesses. I actually had one answer and then when I talked to my colleagues, I learned there was another answer too. So we'll, we will find out together, I think. Okay, here we go. I'm going to talk now about the, the Nasher's sculpture. And let's see here. All right, that was, did everyone see that? Yes, great. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a quote from Mark DeSuvro. Let's make sure, yep, okay. He says, I like to do interactive work. I really believe that the piece needs to be all the way around you. With sculpture, you can get inside of it. It gives you a different kind of feeling. Um, and that is certainly something you can do when you experience the sculpture in person. And I hope that once we're a little bit um, more physically free, you guys can come and take a look. But I also thought we would do something a little bit different to help um, just kind of look at the sculpture since we're looking at two dimensional photos. I'm gonna ask you to grab that piece of paper that we asked you to have available in the confirmation. Um, if you didn't receive that confirmation, don't worry about it. If you have any piece of paper handy, it can be a blank piece of printer paper, it can be a legal pad, it can be a post-it note. Just grab whatever you have, a pencil, pen, marky, marky, sharpie, or a marker, crayon. I have plenty of crayons in my house. And I'm gonna hold up this piece of paper, but it's gonna look strange because of my background. I'm just gonna ask you to divide it in half. So you can either draw a line down the center, or I'm just gonna fold mine in half. Now you have two halves of your paper. I'd like you to focus on one half. And we've already been looking at this picture for some time. So let's look at this next one. And I'm gonna ask you to sketch the sculpture. Now, don't, don't worry, we can't see you. We can't see your sketches. And I always tell my students a sketch is a quick drawing and it doesn't have to look perfect. 
And it definitely won't because I'm only giving you 30 seconds. So let's go ahead, focus on the Desubaru right here, and let's sketch it for 30 seconds. And I'll do it too, so I won't be like one of those gym teachers who tells you to do stuff but then doesn't do it too. All right, you have five seconds left. I'll show mine to prove that I did it also. All right, let's go ahead and look at your other half of your paper and I'm gonna show you one more view. If you'll do another 30 second sketch starting now. All right, five seconds left. And time's up. Here's my little sketch too. Ugh, so weird. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> okay, so this sculpture definitely rewards you for looking at it from all sides and from underneath. And that's always something that I encourage people to do when they come and look. Because as you can see, these shapes and these lines, they start to shift. When you walk around the sculpture, they start to overlap and the forms are just, um, they kind of co constantly transform as you walk around and underneath the sculpture. I have a couple more views too, just so you can see a little bit more close up. And you can see underneath, you can have a nice detail of that knot or that sphere that you have in the middle. and a nice close up of the, the steel I-beam. So unlike the, the sculpture at the DMA, ours is raw steel, um, and you can really see the nice texture on the outside of the I-beam. Something that I often think about with this sculpture too is that it's enormous. It's 35 feet tall, 35 feet four inches tall. If you're walking from the building back to the back of the garden, it's about a span of 47 feet. That's about 30 feet wide, so it's huge. Also weighs about 11 and a quarter tons. But all that being said, it looks incredibly dynamic to me, kind of like what Catherine was saying um, about Ave with the, the Dallas Museum of Art. It's certainly rooted to the ground with those three points where the legs touch the earth, but also with those diagonal lines and those great, that great vertical line, you have a sense of soaring. So even though this isn't a sculpture that can physically move, like you saw in the video at the earliest part of our workshop, it still has a great sense of movement to me when I'm looking at it. There's also a great combination of both simple and complex. You have a sculpture here that's made of basically six straight lines and three circles. And yet um, there is, is a lot going on here. Um, it's made of a single material and a single color, but that also doesn't take away from the complexity of the sculpture. And you've got to think about too, you know, these are simple lines and shapes, but we're working with 22,000 pounds of material. So it takes a lot of planning. Another thing that DeSubro said is that he's always conscious of balance and gravity's center point. So for all those people who like to make connections between arts and other subjects, there's a lot of physics going on with this sculpture. Now, initially, Raymond Nasher, who started the Nasher Sculpture Center, he was interested in commissioning a new work of art for the garden, uh, for the center, which opened in 2003. And then he saw this sculpture installed in the Gogosian Gallery in New York City, and he loved it. So let's go back forward. And so these are pictures of the sculpture inside a building, which I never would have imagined before I found these pictures on the internet. Really kind of fascinating to see how it looks inside. And so instead, um, Ray Nasher decided to purchase this sculpture and bring it to the center. You might notice that it almost looks like the sculpture is punching through the ceiling. 
It in fact is not, but Subaru had to chop off the top in order to have it fit inside. And if you look here, you can see the weld mark of where he reattached the top of the sculpture once it made it to Dallas. And so when it came to Dallas, it was completely disassembled. It was the second sculpture installed in our garden, only after Richard Serra's My Curves Are Not Mad. So if you've ever visited the Nasher, that's another huge steel piece. Um, by no coincidence, um, Richard Serra and, and um, Mark DeSupero both spent time in San Francisco and working with ships and steel, so they have that in their history. But you see here, the installation images, um, there's Mark Super on the right-hand side. Um, as we mentioned earlier, super active in installation. I'm told that if he were allowed to, he would have driven that crane right onto the property. Um, and that's also why it was the second sculpture that was installed in the garden, because it had to be brought in with the crane before the wall was finished construction and before we put in any kind of grass. Um, in this, this picture that you see with the Subaru, you can see him welding it to this block. And for those of you who are interested in the, um, the how this happened and the engineering of it, it's welded to concrete blocks, which are sunk into piers into bedrock, which makes this sculpture really sturdy and will probably never move again. I can't imagine when or why that would happen. And then our next image is of it completely assembled, but again, before the garden and the, the building are completely finished. Let's see, what else do I say? Oh, there was a little bit of concern actually um, when the sculpture was placed so close to the building that it would dwarf the building, but um, it was pretty widely um, agreed upon with Ray. His daughter, Andrew, was there for the installation. Um, Steve Nash, who was the director at the time, they thought the scale was just perfect next to the sculpture, I'm sorry, next to the building. And then when you think of it in terms of all the skyscrapers around, it's kind of not that big if you think about it in that context. So just to talk a little bit more about Mark de Subra's process, a lot of times he makes these quick drawings both before and after he creates sculptures. Um, they're not necessarily blueprints, but they're just to capture the essence and the form of the sculpture that he's about to make. He often uses ink and paintbrush and they almost they start to resemble calligraphy in a sense. He makes adjustments um, basically as he's still constructing the sculpture, so he allows for chance and improvisation even as they're moving these huge steel pieces throughout the air, trying to figure out how they'll go together. Um, he often has a final adjustment with how long the legs will be, sometimes cutting off a little bit before the sculpture is placed on the ground. And here's another one of those sketches too. Um, as we've mentioned before, he likes to do a lot of the work himself. So he's involved with cutting the steel, He's involved with a type of steel bending that I know very little bit about, but it's called cold bending. So instead of, I would think you would want to heat up the steel to make it more viable so you can bend it, he instead often uses a crane and a 20 ton anchor to bend the steel. Sorry, I don't know more about that. He's also involved in directly cutting the steel. So you can see him on the right hand side. Um, you can actually see the cutout piece in the hole that's left behind. So. This is also an older picture of him here. Um, the Subaru has also said he derives a lot of joy in doing the art, and I see that in these pictures that we have here. Um, speaking of joy, and I haven't mentioned this yet, the name of our sculpture is Aviva Amore, which in Italian means long live love. And I have this great picture of the Subaru wearing a hard hat with the word Amore on the brim. And I think this also goes along with what Catherine said earlier as far as his peaceful protests, um, which he's gotten in trouble for a couple of times, but um, I think the idea of peace and love, they pop up a lot in the sculptures that the Subaru works with. This is a sculpture I personally love as well. I lead a lot of tours and workshops at the Nasher, and one of the most fun things we can do is move our bodies to look like the sculpture. So that's two elementary school tours on the bottom, and then we've had uh, yoga out there by um, the Viva Amore and people doing this wonderful triangle pose next to the sculpture is a nice background. Um, so the last uh, poll was what art forms is the Subaru influenced by? I learned from my colleagues that music is definitely one of those art forms. Another one is poetry. And that sculpture that we saw in the beginning, the one that was moving is called for W.B. Yeats. Subaru 
is a great lover and reader of poetry. Um, he has named a lot of his sculptures after poets. Uh, he writes his own poetry too. He published a book called Dream Book in 2008 that it pairs pictures of his sculptures with either his own philosophical ruminations or published poems. And I think perhaps at the end, there might be an opportunity for us to see a video of him reading one of these poems. And that's it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing now and see if any questions came up. I do see one question. What are significant early works of Marc de Suvere on display? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I personally know that Marc de Suvere's works of art um, on display all over the world. He saw the works that are in France, and I think some still remain there. And he also had a studio for some time there as well. There's this wonderful Storm King outdoor sculpture garden in north of um, New York City. We have them throughout Dallas. There's also sculptures in this wonderful, um, it's, a, it's like Storm King in that it's an outdoor, not totally sculpture park, but it's in Fishtail, Montana. And this also happens to be a working sheep and cattle ranch. You can look, go there and see pictures of the Desubra with cattle grazing around it, which is really wonderful. As far as early works, I don't know if anyone wants to, to jump in on that. I don't have a specific answer to that question. I believe that um, on Space Time, the studio, the artist studio, there is a map of um, sculptures across the country and the world. All right. Um, um, a question. Listen, I I'll will, I will touch, no, you're good. I will touch base just very briefly on one of his earlier works during my portion as well, so that'll help cover that too. Great. There was a question about Ave too. Um, says, Ave was part of a litter that DeSubro created for the Whitney exhibition in 75. And five of Ave's siblings reside at Storm King that I mentioned earlier during the restoration. Did Ave express any nostalgia for her siblings? Does she miss them? I love this. Does anyone want to comment on that? I think she totally missed her siblings. <laughs> um, the name of the Nasher's piece, sorry, when I get going, I know I talk a little fast and I mumble. It's called Aviva Amore, it says long live love. And I was just asked what, it, what year it was made. And of course I have that somewhere in my notes. I think it's 2001, I'll pop in later and say for sure. The Nasher's sculpture garden was opened in 2003. I'm pretty sure 2001 is the correct year, but I'll confirm that. But in the meantime, I'm gonna pass it over to Anna. Thank you, Melissa. Firstly, I just wanted to say thank you so much for organizing this, as Catherine said, and bringing us all together. It's, it's so exciting, even if it is virtually, to be able to work together. It's been wonderful. So I am going to share my screen, and I'll probably speak for the next eight or nine minutes and then we'll have some time hopefully for questions after that if you guys just want to type them in the box. So let's see. Okay, hopefully you all could see this first slide. All right, awesome. So um, as Melissa mentioned at the intro, my name's Anna Kern. I'm the arts manager of North Park Center. Today, as you can probably imagine from this first slide, I'm gonna be focusing on our Ad Astra, the wonderful gigantic piece in our North Court at North Park Center. Um, the work is in the collection of Nancy Nasher and her husband, David Hammesager, who've been the owners of North Park since 1995. So although I will be focusing on Ad Astra, you see it to the left here, I just also wanted to quickly note, and this is, addresses the question earlier, um, that we have one of DeSouvreau's early works entitled In the Bushes, also located at the center. This is from 1970 to 1975. And it's just actually right to the west of Ad Astra. So next time you're at the shopping center, if you wanna check it out, it's a really, really nice comparison between you know, one of his more recent works, the 2005 Ad Astra versus an older piece. Um, it's on loan to us from the Raymond and Patsy Nasher collection, as you see below. So uh, before, to, before delving into the installation, which that's kind of going to be my main focus here and a few anecdotal stories as well, I want to briefly provide some context on North Park and how Nancy came across Ad Astra, because I think it really helps explain the piece and why it is where it is. 
So I've included this aerial view here. In 2005 and 2006, Nancy and David spearheaded their 1.2 million square foot expansion of North Park. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details that I'd like to in this image, but I just wanted to note that you can see the 2005 expansion if you follow my mouse from this stretch right here. And then the 2006 expansion is ginormous. It's this huge stretch right here, including the AMC, including the food court, and also this garden right here. And I just point this out because at Astra is in North Court right here, and we brought it through this main entrance. So later on when you see the installation video, it's kind of helpful for context to see this. So for our owners, it's really crucial that each major court throughout the center features landscape or art as a focal point to really give our visitors this aesthetic shopping experience. Um, you know, they substitute that for uh, kiosks or flashy advertisements. Instead, we have this really beautiful experience as you walk around the center. Um, for example, on the left, you see our infamous fountains with the turtles and the ducks that I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, in the Neiman Marcus Court, or we often use artwork as in the example on the right, um, Joel Shapiro's 20 Elements for Nordstrom Court. So with this huge expansion, Nancy was really looking for a sculpture that could serve as a focal point for North Court, which is what we call our main gathering area of the new addition. And she really wanted to find a piece that visitors could walk through and walk around and still activate that space. So it's a very specific piece she was looking for. Um, and during that time, she happened to be reading the New York Times, actually, and she came across this review on DeSouvre's 2005 exhibition at Storm King Art Center, which Melissa, you referenced, I believe, earlier. And the article featured a photo, a very small photo of Ad Astra. And when Nancy saw it, uh, she had this sort of immediate inclination that that could be the piece for North Court. And then she and David ended up flying to New York. They saw the piece in person. And once they saw it in person, they knew that it would be the right fit. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the photo from the article, but I did include these scans here of that exhibition catalog. Um, and you can see it was in honor of Richard Bellamy, which was a longtime friend of Mark DeSouvro and also an art dealer. And you actually get Ad Astra in the photo on the right when it was being installed at Storm King, which I think is a really interesting comparison. Um, so now I'm going to play, let me click play on this. Just a brief, it's about three and a half minutes long video of the installation in the background. And I just have a few points that I want to make. So I'm not going to go necessarily scene by scene um, just for the sake of time. So I'll be talking more generally, but I will link this YouTube video in the chat in just a little bit. So as I mentioned before, the sculpture was installed in 2006. It was disassembled at Storm King in New York. It was brought all the way from New York on a flatbed truck to Dallas and then brought through our main north entrance doors as I pointed out in that aerial view a little bit ago. And you can kind of see that throughout the video. You can see them cleaning the piece because of course through transportation, it was really dirty. Um, and to get a sense of the scale, Ad Astra is, it's huge. It's 48 feet tall. Um, and once it's fully installed in North Port, North Port, it actually misses the ceiling just by four feet. So to me, that's a real testament to how perfectly this piece fits into that area. The sculpture also weighs around 14 tons, which is insane to me. And um, fortunately, because North Court was still under construction, we were able to reinforce that area, that foundation there, and able to fully support the piece so that it is directly on the ground, which is really important, I think, to interacting with the piece. Um, some interesting statistics just to note, Ad Astra is the largest, and as you see here, I wanted to point out DeSouvro with, of course, his, his red, orangish sweater, which I feel like he wears that color a lot. Um, and some interesting statistics, I just wanted to mention Ad Astra is the largest DeSouvro work installed indoors, and it's the only example where you can see the sculpture from two levels. Um, here you have Nancy, of course, on the left. Paula Cooper was very involved and active in the installation on site this day, along with the senior director of Paula Cooper Gallery, which was just right to the left of Nancy in that clip beforehand. 
Um, so you will see, let's see, um, although it's not shown exactly in the video, let's see, sorry, I lost my place. Um, also in reference to what Melissa was saying earlier, I just wanted to mention throughout the entirety of the video, as you see, Mark DeSuvro is involved in every aspect. So he's up there in the cherry picker, screwing those bolts in by hand. In a little bit, he'll be welding the base to the ground. And it's just a testament to despite the injuries that he had, um, and despite his age, even though this was in 2005, he is committed to his pieces. And to me, that's really the most beautiful part of watching this film, one of, one of them, I should say. Um, so let's see. Although it's not in this video exactly, the team realized that upon raising the piece, the wheels of the crane actually started to lift up on, off of the ground. And so despite Nancy kind of wanting to, Nancy and David and the team wanting to figure out the orientation in C2 and turn it and figure out what made sense for the space, once the crane started to lift, they set the work down and they said, you know what, this is it. Wherever it is right now, this is gonna work. And and the irony, I guess, of it all is that it ended up being the absolute perfect position for that piece. And I'm going to pull in a photo after this video ends just to kind of explain that further. Um, of course, you see Nancy and DeSuvro and the, the clip just before. And it was a 24-hour, very long installation. And you can see their enthusiasm, you know, despite some unexpected challenges, I would say it ended up being the incredible piece that it is today. So I'm going to just end the video there and let's see. I wanted to bring in, as I mentioned, this one photo on the left because I think it really helps um, to show the orientation. So, um, so on the left, the placement allows this very large, the largest beam to be pointing towards the um, escalators and towards the second level. So in that way, it really helps the uh, traffic and navigating direction, allowing people to understand they can go up, they can go on the second level. And then also, if you look at the legs, it really um, opens up that space. It allows traffic to go from east to west, west to east, rather than blocking it off in any way. And so again, just like I was saying before, the orientation, it's, it's perfect for North Court, which is really wonderful. Um, and then the nature of the space, Oh, also, I just wanted to point out um, one thing on the photo on the right. Um, so the, the sculpture has a really interesting interaction with the surrounding architecture. You can see the reflection of this bright orange red color throughout the tiles on the second level, depending on the time of day, also throughout those glass railings. And you can't see it, of course, in this photo, but also on the cement floor on the first level. So in that way, it, it's this sort of all encompassing feeling when you're in that space with Ad Astra as the focal point. So the architecture also goes really well with the piece. And then um, I just wanted to bring up these three images here. So the nature of the space also allows visitors to really view the work from all angles. Um, and I think we touched on this in multiple of our presentations beforehand, but depending on where you are, whether you, you're above the piece, whether you're below the piece, or whether you're sort of walking 360 around it, there's all these different viewpoints that cause it to almost look like a different piece altogether. And Melissa, I love that sketch that you brought up because it's really demonstrating this point here. And then um, some may notice the three planners at each leg in these photos. So we actually place these here in this sort of an interesting fact in order to protect visitors from hitting their heads on the sloped I-beams. So being a public shopping center, of course, we have to consider ADA regulations and things that before this position I would never, you know, think to even consider. But it's something that's really thoughtful and really subtle, and it allows the space to still be open um, despite being a public shopping center. And so this note leads me to my very last point. And um, I just wanted to note both the orientation and this open accessible nature of Ad Astra are really crucial to the success of the sculpture in the space. And I think it points towards the importance of Ad Astra at North Park. It's really allowed North, Car 
North Court to thrive as this main common area where we host all of our major events, our gatherings, our performances. You can see in this photo to the left, we have this wonderful ballet dance. In the right, we have the Dallas Symphony Orchestra who come out all the time to perform under Ad Astra. We've had many fashion shows. This is our 50th anniversary, but where the models are actually strutting in and out of the sculpture, which I think is fantastic. Um, and then this is just an example of um, our Chinese New Year, but there are endless others. We have around 120 events per year. And I think because of the nature of Ad Astra, it just has become this iconic part of North Park. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing to watch. And that's where I'm going to end. I know we're running out of time, but I did just want to mention we have our North Park magazine and in our fall issue of 2019, we have this wonderful article on Mark DeSouvero where we interviewed him and we incorporated those answers into our article. So I will also link that. I don't have time to pull it up, but I will link it into our chat as well. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. And I'm going to end there. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Anna. I want to go back. I feel like um, I know that I missed something in our chats. Um, Suzanne Cowles asked, other than the drawings, does he make any models? It is not my impression that he makes models. He just works on drawings and then makes his big, big sculptures, which I think requires a lot of confidence, um, which I admire greatly. Um, I think that might be all of the questions that we have um, still out there. We do have a few short minutes before one o'clock. So I, if, oh, that's not true. We asked questions all throughout this webinar and I haven't, we haven't addressed all of them. So the tallest, I think we all would agree the tallest is the North Park sculpture, right? 48 feet tall. Ours is only 35 feet tall. So yeah. Um, which ones does Zero help to install? All of them. I love seeing all of those pictures. Um, really, really great and all those videos. Thank you so much for, for sharing those. And yes, ours was made in 2001. I was pretty sure, but I looked it up stealthily while Anna was talking. Um, for anyone who would like to make an art activity, I took away the background so things wouldn't look weird. If you received the confirmation email, I suggested just gathering some things around your house that you might use to make a miniature de Subaru. And we just have a few short minutes, so maybe this is something that you can do after uh, the webinar ends. But for instance, for some reason, I have a ton of coffee stirrers in our house. So that would be a nice stand-in for the steel I-beams. I also have these paper straws that I had from my son's birthday party and we didn't use all of. Um, if you wanted to use something like string to attach your pieces, I also have a lot of strange tapes that I've gathered over the years, whether it's just normal scotch tape, I have this ninja tape that someone gave me as a, a gift one day, and then fun washi tape as well. And then if you think about it, a lot of the times the DeSouvro um, sculptures, they have that circular, that central circular knot. So that's something that you could, you know, take a plastic lid and cut it a circle out of that. You could use cardboard. If you're like me, you've been ordering some things. You might have some broken down boxes around the house. I also have cardstock. Um, if you want to make a drawing both before and or after like to Subaru, those might be some things that um, you entertain as you're making your sculpture. Um, also, if you feel so inclined, you can always put those pictures on social media and tag any of our institutions, the National Sculpture Center, Dallas Museum of Art, North Park Center, tag to Subaru. And if we are smart and can find them, I would love to see pictures of your creations. Um, some other things. Oh, I do want to say something that I would have shown had we not had so much great information to share. And I'm not upset about that at all. I hope nobody else is. Take a look at that Tippett Rise Center um, email, no, website. It's tippetrise.org, T-I-P-P-E-T, rise.org. They produced a lovely set of videos of Mark DeSuver reading poetry by different um, poets that he admires. Um, and this was just done in the last year. So it seems like real time um, story time with Mark DeSuvo. It's really lovely. And like I said, you can also see his sculptures at different times of year, whether it's snowy there or there are cattle walking around. Um, I think it is, it's time for us to sign off. I want to thank Catherine and Hillary and Fran and Anna for joining me today. I want to thank 
all of our participants, which I did see in the chat were largely Dallas, but not. There are some folks from Denton and Richardson and someone who lives in Athens, Georgia. So thanks so much for joining us today. Take a look at um, all of us. We're doing these things all the time. I hope that you join us again. Do you guys want to say anything? Goodbye. <laughs> all right. You guys have a great rest of the day. Bye. Be well. All right. Thank you. Thanks for doing this.